All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Ian McLaughlin, and I'm a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania. And um, I'll be honest, this past week hasn't been the best, so I'm just going to go ahead and get right to the topic. So um, today I wanted <clears throat> to talk about a condition that affects 45 million people in the United States. And I've seen pretty similar estimates um, outside of the US, like, like around 10 to 15 percent of people. Um, so I mean, the point is that it's a fairly common problem, uh, and I'm talking about tinnitus or tinnitus. <clears throat> if you're unfamiliar with this condition, simply speaking, it's a persistent perception of hearing a sound in the absence of any like actual external sound. And by the way, you know, you like I just did, you might have heard different pronunciations of the word, you, you know, like tinnitus and tinnitus. Um, both are evidently accepted. And, uh, you know, I totally get why people would avoid using the tinnitus pronunciation because that that itis typically, that, that suffix of itis, typically implies like some form of inflammation and um, the word isn't actually spelled like with an I-T-I-S suffix and there isn't necessarily any kind of like inflammation going on um, with every kind of uh, tinnitus. So for being sticklers, uh, the tinnitus is, is probably the more linguistically justified pronunciation, uh, but don't worry about it. Everybody's familiar with, with the condition. Everybody who's familiar with the condition would, would know exactly what you mean uh, if you use either pronunciation. Um, the word itself is derived from a Latin word, uh, tinieri or tiniere. Uh, I'm not quite sure how, to how I would pronounce that Latin word, uh, but it literally translates to ring or tinkle like a bell, uh, which is sort of, you know, misleadingly innocuous. <laughs> um, but uh, so anyways, um, you know, generally speaking, uh, tinnitus is associated with a per uh, persistent high-pitched ringing, uh, but there are different manifestations of the condition, you know, with different types of perceived sounds like, like buzzing or clicking, um, hissing or humming. Uh, and I've seen the word roaring used, uh, which I honestly struggle to even like try to understand what that would sound like. Uh, but Pretty much everyone will experience uh, tinnitus at some point in their lives, you know, particularly if you've ever been to like a particularly loud uh, concert. You know, I've been to a few shows and concert, concerts in my day and I, I remember it being particularly noticeable after seeing Metallica and after seeing uh, Audio Slave uh, in my younger, younger years. Um, but interestingly enough, it didn't happen after seeing uh, musicians or artists like uh, Flying Lotus or Toki Monster. So, I don't know, maybe there's a genre-specific effect. I kind of doubt that. I'm obviously kidding. Uh, but if you've ever noticed that sort of like high-pitched ringing in your ears when you're driving or walking back from, from a loud concert, that's basically like an acute, short-term form of tinnitus. And so, you know, generally speaking, this will just go away on its own for most people. Um, and so, so tinnitus is broadly divided into two categories, subjective and objective. So subjective tinnitus um, is the experience of a sound that only the person suffering from the condition can hear. Um, and you know, it's like only happening to you, in other words. Um, ob objective tinnitus is a little bit crazier from a biological perspective. I remember learning about this back in the day and I kind of forgot about it. Uh, but so basically it's a form of the condition where like a physician can actually hear the sound when examining a person who's suffering from the condition. So objective tinnitus is sometimes also called somatic sound. Uh, which basically means like a sound that's being generated by the body. So of the two, um, subjective tinnitus, you know, the form where only the person uh, who's suffering from the condition can hear it, is quite a bit more common. And I've seen estimates that over 99% of cases um, are subjective tinnitus. And I, I honestly don't even know how that would be calculated, but um, I, I've seen those figures. And so objective tinnitus uh, tends to be caused by like a misbehaving blood vessel of some sort that's, you know, impinging upon components of the inner ear. Um, though it, it can be caused by like contractions of, of muscles that are proximal to the components of the auditory pathway that like receive and amplify sound uh, before it ever even hits the brain. Um, and so, you know, things like ossicles, uh, the three bones in the middle ear that are some of the smallest little bones in the human body. I think they're pretty cool, so let's take a look. Um, I've always loved the names of, the, of these little bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Uh, and I don't know if maybe that's stapes. Uh, I'm sure it's pronounced different ways by different um, uh, professors and stuff, but um, it, they basically translate to the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Um, and I've always found, you know, auditory anatomy to be so thoroughly strange, you know, like along with vestibular anatomy, which we'll check out, it just seems like, like a series of such complex and intricate structures that it, it's just amazing to me. Um, and so, you know, by the way, 
By the way, speaking of the vestibular system, when people say we have five senses, you know, vision, taste, smell, touch, and hearing, you can always say we have at least one more, uh, from an anatomical perspective at least, with our vestibular system. So let's take a look at these, which equally strange and, and crazy. <laughs> but um, So uh, this, the, this anatomy is like right next to our auditory system in the ear, um, and it is what enables us to be sensitive to acceleration. And, you know, this isn't just like a nerdy semantic point, like saying that, that taste and smell are basically part of the same sensory system, which is true. So like, you know, distinguishing them, it's not quite as distinct from like vision, for example. Um, but we have totally distinct anatomical structures that enable us to sense like acceleration, uh, rotation, head orientation, and, and so on, things like that. And that's our vestibular system. Uh, and so it's the saccule, the utricle, and three semicircular canals. Those are like the, the primary anatomical substrates or like parts of our anatomy that enable us to do this. And so, you know, I can't help myself, uh, but one of my favorite parts of the vestibular system are the otoconia, otoconia. Um, and so here, I'll show you those. It's just so crazy, <laughs> which are basically like these little nuggets made out of calcium carbonate um, that are, you know, somewhere between one and 50 microns in size. Um, I've seen them described as usually spherical. Uh, and calcium carbonate is basically what composes like a majority of the shells that you might see on a beach, you know, as well as like um, the, the, the shells of eggs that you might have eaten earlier today for, for breakfast or whatever, um, or, or the shells of snails. So. I don't want to get too deep <laughs> into the uh, biology of the vestibular system because it's not particularly relevant, uh, and you know, given that it, it's very, it is tan, you know, tan tangentially like related to today's topic. But I just remember being sort of blown away, like, uh, with how this part of the vestibular system works. Like, basically, those little nuggets of shell, you know, they have some mass, right? And you know, they're not weightless, and so they'll follow Newton's first law of thermodynamics, which taught us that you know, objects at rest, or importantly, objects that are moving will remain at rest or continue moving at a constant speed unless acted upon by another force, right? So, so you know, as a result, when you tilt your head in a certain direction, those little calcium carbonate nuggets will tumble in, you know, uh, one direction or another. And those little, you know, hair cell cilia, those fingers reaching up into this layer of goo that's between them, uh, will sort of be tickled by the movement of those little nuggets. Um, and it's that process, those, those little nuggets tickling those little fingers reaching up uh, from hair cells that uh, enables us to, to you know, know when we're tilting our heads or in what direction we're tilting them. So um, a very similar process underlies our ability to detect acceleration, right? the movement of these little, these little shell nuggets. Uh, and so those little fingers, by the way, that, that reach up from those hair cells towards the bottom there, um, they're very similar to the types of hair cells that enable us to hear vibrations. And so we're back to our topic. So here's an image of um, a scanning electron microscope to, to give you an idea of what those hair cells actually look like, which makes it pretty clear why they're called hair cells. Um, and you know, again, they're very similar to those um, types of hair cells that, that enable us to, to hear. Um, and so, you know, it just blows me away that like we have these tiny little grains of shell matter that are like, they in, are, we evolved to have them accumulate inside of our ears. You know, we actually evolved that way. Uh, and it just strikes me as being like a pretty simple solution to a very, very difficult problem of basically like using the first law of uh, thermodynamics to enable us to perceive how our bodies are moving in space. You know, maybe it's just me, but but I just think that's that's so cool. Anyways, okay, back to tinnitus. So so we broadly have two types of tinnitus, right? Uh, subjective and objective. Subjective um, tinnitus are, are forms of a condition where the sound is solely perceived by the person suffering from the condition, while objective tinnitus can actually be heard by others. Um, using like a stethoscope or, or something like that. Um, and I've seen some biomedical scientists break down tinnitus into like additional categories, like, like pulsatile tinnitus, which is um, describing, you know, the perception of like a, a sort of rhythmic beat, in which perhaps intuitively is, is usually caused by the vascular system. Um, and so, you know, that, that rhythm tends to reflect a person's heartbeat. Um, other things can cause, cause it too, but, you know, anyways, uh, what we're really distinguishing here is, is whether the source of that persistent sound is either purely perceptual or if there's like an actual sound being generated that's causing that, that persistent perceived sound. So um, some people might like reflexively conceive of this condition as being, you know, a persistent hallucination, right? Which, you know, it's not too far off, particularly, you know, subjective tinnitus. And 
we know that there are some drugs that can cause auditory hallucinations. Some that purportedly tend to induce auditory hallucinations quite a bit more than other kinds of, uh, of hallucinations. So for anybody that's familiar with this whole sort of experimental medicinal chemistry world, uh, diisopropyl uh, tryptamine, or DIPT, was described by Alexander Shulgin, who's like a was a, a pretty singular scientist in, in the history of medicinal chemistry. Um, really interesting kind of biography. If, if you're interested in this, I strongly recommend you, you check it out. Um, but he described it, this drug, DIPT, as producing primarily auditory hallucinations, you know, rather than the visual hallucinations that the majority of like well-known psychedelic hallucinogens tend to produce. Uh, but generally speaking, those types of auditory hallucinations are the one, you know, the kinds that are generated by a drug like DIPT. Um, or, you know, auditory hallucinations that are, you know, more commonly associated with, like, psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia, they tend to manifest as the perception of, you know, voices or the experience of some kind of, you know, music-like perception. Uh, and the voices can be very, very subtle, like, like incoherent or in, uh, undecipherable whispering, um, you know, that kind of thing. But, but there, you know, these are slightly more complex auditory uh, perceptions. With tinnitus, we're generally talking about, like, very, very simple... Um, auditory perceptions, you know, again, buzzing, hissing, or ringing, right? Um, and so the condition can be both uh, bilateral or unilateral, meaning it can be perceived as happening uh, through one ear or both ears. And um, the perceived volume, like, like how loud the perceived um, um, uh, sound is, it can range from being very, very, very subtle and barely perceptible to being quite loud and therefore quite debilitating. So, okay, so what causes um, tinnitus? So the most intuitive case is, um, is when people are exposed to really loud sounds pretty regularly, like if you're regularly going to Metallica shows. Um, but, you know, so, so what that does, here, I'll bring this back. What that does is it causes those little hair cells um, to break. And in some cases, they, that can be accompanied by the brain uh, receiving a persistent signal in the absence um, of those hair cells that we perceive as a persistent and very irritating sound. Um, that's, that's like the most common cause of tinnitus. And, um, and again, that would be subjective tinnitus. So um, to be specific, you know, let's say we're talking about somebody who works with a piece of equipment, you know, something like a drill or something like that. That's particularly loud. Landscaping equipment or, you know, whatever they work at a, at a, a, a gun range or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's consistently loud, whatever it is they're working with, consistently loud at the same tone, right? So like a drill, it's not like you can, well, I guess you can, but <laughs> you'll, you'll generally like uh, hover around the same sort of tone with, with any given piece of equipment, right? And so, you know, every day this person is hearing that specific tone and it's super loud, you know, it's a super loud version of that tone. And um, in, in, you know, many cases of tinnitus occur when a person in that kind of a situation both loses hearing at that specific tone, because that the corresponding hair cells, hair cell or hair cell or cells have break uh, broken, um, but also you know so so they lost hearing at that tone, but they also just continuously experience a persistent hum at that tone. Um, so you know you might have heard of phantom limb syndrome, where you know for someone who's lost an arm or, or a leg or something like that due to some unfortunate accident that there's a similarity here, right? And in those cases, the brain is registering damage or pain in the limb that's no longer there. Um, this is kind of similar, where, where the cells that would normally translate those vibrations um, into perceived sounds are no longer there. But the brain is, for one reason or another, registering stimulation from where those cells normally would have been. So um, not all hearing loss is, is accompanied by tinnitus, uh, and you know, quite a few biomedical conditions can be associated with tinnitus as a symptom with like, no obvious requirement that um, auditory hair cells be damaged. So you know, for example, some metabolic diseases uh, involving you know, like heart disease or, or diabetes or, or damage to the neck or, or TMJ, you know, things like that those can be associated with um, inducing tinnitus. And, you know, they're all over the place in terms of, of, um, of, you know, what kind of conditions can be associated. And so also some drugs can be associated with inducing tinnitus. And, you know, there's a bunch of different kinds in terms of, of you know, like molecular structure, antibiotics, antivirals, uh, painkillers, antihistamines, and, you know, other categories of drugs um, have been found to induce tinnitus in some people. And so um, the condition can happen due to issues that arise basically at any point along the entire auditory pathway from hair cells to potentially the neurons within the brain that you know, interpret the signals that those hair cells would generate. Um, you know, most, in most cases, uh, people are just okay with it and they just sort of get used to it or you know, as we call it, habituate to the sound. Um, 
but uh, uh, and you know this is this is the part of tinnitus that that's particularly interesting to me. One of the the models for understanding um, tinnitus suggests that not only auditory pathways are involved. So um, you know, particularly for people who who don't just get used to it, you know, in, like there are parts of the brain that we have no direct you know proximal um, anatomical regulatory relationship. Um, over our ability to hear things can also contribute to someone experiencing tinnitus. And so this is like a whole big topic that's, you know, probably exclusively uh, interesting to people who study these things. But, but the main nugget of the model that's, that's interesting is the regions of the brain that are responsible for determining things like how we devote our, or the things to which we devote our attention or how we feel about the thing on which we're focusing uh, may very well be involved. So, um, <laughs> um, and so we're talking about regions of the brain um, like the salience network, um, which includes things like the anterior insula, the anterior cingulate, um, and, and parts of the thalamus. Uh, you know, people with tinnitus wouldn't really care very much about it unless it caused some kind of an emotional reaction, you know, a distress of some kind. Uh, you know, as a result, regions of the brain that are involved in regulating, you know, emotional states are likely involved in the condition. And on top of that, uh, regions of the brain that are involved in, in memory may also be involved. You know, similar to the manifestation of chronic pain syndromes, tinnitus may require the involvement of memory-associated circuitry to sustain the perceived perception. And so there's a, a great review by a group of people with, you know, surnames that my tongue just, you know, hasn't been trained to articulate, uh, but I'll struggle through it. Uh, Languth, Kruiser, Kleinjung, and De Ritter. De Ritter. Uh, from uh, this review is from several years ago. Those are the authors um, from several years ago. Uh, this review goes into a bit more depth th than I'm going to describe here, um, and I'll put the ref in the um, the description below in, in case you want to check it out. It doesn't necessarily go into like tremendous depth, but it's a pretty broad review of the topic, and, and I think it does a good job of, of providing a sense of the overall biology. And it's pretty you know it's understandable to people outside of the the field. Um, so I haven't gotten into the recent publication for today yet. So why did I go into all of this, you know, backstory? Well, part of my PhD research involved oh, oops, involved understanding the effects that various drugs and that that people take recreationally, from you know alcohol and nicotine to cocaine and, and morphine. Um, and so one of the regions of the brain that has been highlighted as um, potentially critical to generating tinnitus that causes distress, at least in some cases, is the nucleus accumbens or the ventral striatum, depending on the person with whom you're speaking, uh, the scientist with whom you're speaking. So, you know, due to the, su the super important role that this brain region plays in determining not only the behaviors that we exhibit, but even the things to which we pay attention, um, the nucleus accumbens is easily one of the most intriguing parts of the brain, one of the most important uh, from my perspective. I'm a little bit biased, but um, it's a major recipient of dopamine. And it basically, Basically, any drug that people use recreationally causes an increase in levels of dopamine that the nucleus accumbens receives. So, in fact, once the effects of those drugs subside, uh, you know, a while after they've taken the drug, uh, and people start wanting to take more of the drug, they start experiencing some cravings, you can watch, you know, you, you can, you can, I've, I've, like, watched levels of dopamine decrease in that very part of the brain, like, as the effects of a drug is terminating. Um, you can you can set a watch to it. <laughs> so, for any like neuroanatomy nerds out there, this connection this connection uh, between experiencing a sort of phantom sound perception and actually noticing and caring about that sound, um, you know, between the nucleus accumbens and tinnitus, this connection between the two might not be shocking. Um, if you're paying attention to, to something, the nucleus accumbens is almost certainly involved and in experiencing uh, rises in, in levels of dopamine. Uh, but something I found fascinating is that. People who use high doses of, you know, certain psychomotor stimulants, drugs like cocaine or crack cocaine, amphetamine, methamphetamine, and so on, um, pe some people sometimes report experiencing the, this very high-pitched ringing in the ears after ingesting the substance. And, you know, among all the drugs that are used recreationally, it's this category that likely produces the highest, like, dopamine dump in the nucleus accumbens. And, um, you know, those neurons are just being flooded with dopamine. Um, during the, the action of the drug. So um, given this anatomical connectivity, the accumbens and, and models that suggest the involvement of this brain structure, that specific, you know, subjective effect of those drugs that, you know, fire hose blast dopamine uh, uh, in the nucleus accumbens strikes me as, as poten uh, potentially interesting. And I haven't seen anybody kind of pursue whether or not there might be some kind of connection there where you just have elevated levels of dopamine and that just predictably cause causes, um, you know, ringing the ears or tinnitus. So anyway, so I was, you know, 
my own not so short little journey uh, that I went on while reviewing the biology of, of tinnitus after seeing um, this story uh, of a new potential treatment for, for the condition. So a company called Neuromod, Neuromod Devices, um, based in Dublin, Ireland, published a, uh, a clinical trial of a treatment for the condition on the 7th of this month. Uh, which is you know, October of 2020, in case you've lost track of time, like everybody else. Um, and it was published in Science Translational Medicine, which is a very highly regarded uh, biomedical journal. So evidently, it's one of the largest clinical trials for tinnitus treatment to date. So it involved 326 patients for up to a year. And the study was performed with participants in two clinical trial sites, one in Ireland and one in Germany. Um, and what's interesting about this device is that it's totally non-invasive. You know, there aren't like any electrodes being implanted anywhere along the um, auditory pathway or anything like that. So just to give you an idea um, of what this is. So it's, it's a device that's called Lanier or, or Len, Lanieré, L-E-N-I-R-E. So I don't know how to pronounce that, but um, Lanier, I'm gonna go with Lanier. Uh, and so it delivers two forms of sensory stimulation simultaneously. So they deliver sound through the ears, <laughs> as well as some electrical stimulation to the tongue. So here is what we're talking about. You can sort of see um, what I'm talking about here. So from what I understand, it's, it's a, a pair of Bluetooth headphones that play specific sounds that, that, um, that's coupled with a device that goes on the mouth, in the mouth, on the tongue, that delivers tiny electrical pulses. And so it's a technique called bimodal neuromodulation. Uh, and the goal is basically like retraining a person's attention to be just less aware of the ringing sensation. So um, they used uh, scales that are evidently like widely used like, like, um, okay. to quantify uh, the severity of tinnitus uh, several times during their, their treatment period and then followed up 12 months after the participants returned these devices. And so um, evidently they, they also pretty much calibrated each device to each person based on like hearing thresholds and, and tongue sensitivities, you know, things like that. And then participants went on their merry ways with their new device um, uh, for the duration of, of the study. And so they administered the treatment on their own. So it's not like, you know, any kind of, um, you know, scientists came into their, ho their houses and, and applied it. They just did it on their own. And um, it was one hour a day over the course of the full treatment uh, period of 12 weeks. Um, and the minimum treatment wa uh, uh, duration was 36 hours. So that, that was a minimum, 36 hours over the full 12 weeks. And, you know, so that's not like really not a massive imposition. You know, you just had to wear these headphones with a little plate on their tongue for an hour a day, every now and then, uh, you know, at least, or just uh, once a day, not a big deal. So um, here's what the group reported. They report that of the participants who successfully did what they had to do, uh, you know, did that minimum, uh, 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 treatment duration, 74.7, so almost 75%, uh, up to 88.8% demonstrated improvements after their treatment. And um, they also report that the therapeutic effects of the treatment lasted for quite a while after, um, you know, the, after the moment that they uh, returned their devices. So, you know, it didn't cure the condition, but that wasn't even necessarily the question they were asking. This was like a very limited sort of treatment uh, duration. It certainly seemed to improve symptoms for quite a large proportion of the participants and, and like to a non-trivial degree. Um, so, you know, this is intriguing for several reasons. First, as I said earlier, it's non-invasive, no surgery, and therefore significantly lower risk to people who might benefit from the treatment. And then second, there really aren't any particularly effective treatments, you know, specifically designed to treat tinnitus. You know, there's like no medications or devices that are specifically effective at, at curing the condition. The main treatments that we have today are geared towards addressing the suffering that's associated with the condition and, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and, and this group is reporting even greater improvements in the scores of tinnitus on that scale of, of severity, uh, greater improvements relative to those that are achieved by cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And it was often sustained for 12 months, so a full year, which certainly is not bad. So um, there are, you know, other available treatments are things like, you know, using white noise machines um, or things like, like masking devices that can be worn in the ear that, that are basically like white noise machines in your ear. Um, you know, there's medications like tricyclic antidepressants and other anxiolytics that have been used to treat like particularly severe tinnitus. Um, but these medications really aren't prescribed to cure the condition. It's just to relieve the suffering that it can cause. So evidently, uh, the group is planning on performing a few more clinical trials to explore whether they might be able to improve the outcomes for people suffering from the condition by like adjusting stimulation and auditory frequencies. Um, 
and uh, it looks like uh, people can potentially look up clinics that they can go to if they're interested in Ireland, Belgium, and then several places in Germany. All right, so I know I sort of went on for, for more than a bit there, a uh, bit of a journey uh, there to the build-up of the main story, but, but I figured I found you know, the potential connection between pharmacology of drugs that are used recreationally and tinnitus you know, interesting. So I figured other people might find that interesting as well. Uh, and I do feel like you know, the fact that there are these like, little nuggets of stuff, the same stuff that composes seashells inside of our ears is just objectively, I think, pretty cool. All right, that's what I have for you today. Um, and uh, I might have to cut the live half short, but uh, hey everybody, hey Joy. Uh, hello, Eleonora, only here. Yeah, so I only start with the, um, with the, the prepared stuff here. Uh, tinnitus rabbit hole, yeah. Um, okay, let's start the life half. Hello everybody, my name is Ian McLaughlin. I have a PhD in neuroscience and um, I studied addiction and once again, arguably I think the best way to probe whether or not humans have free will, at least one of the best ways. Um, and on YouTube, youtube.com slash anthropoid, I just talked about well, I talked about a lot of things, but I talked primarily, the, the focus was about a new device that just underwent clinical trials to treat, pretty successfully, a condition called tinnitus. And tinnitus is a condition where there's this persistent ringing or, or hissing or buzzing in the ear um, that's perceived. Uh, there are different kinds of tinnitus, and I go into that and some of the biology that might explain it. Um, but this new device, what's, I think, the, the most the coolest thing about it is that it's totally non-invasive and so it's just some headphones and a little kind of palette that you put on your tongue and um yeah check it out youtube.com slash anthropoid hey what's up joe good to see you here too oh, of course of course i forgot every single time yeah and i, I know somebody brought up um tinnitus last week and um this study had come out uh, this clinical trial had come out. I just hadn't seen it yet, um, but uh, but you know I didn't really have any kind of satisfying answer for them because there really isn't a satisfying answer in terms of like potential treatments. So um, I thought I would you know cover this. It's pretty cool. It's pretty innovative. It's a company based out of Dublin, Ireland, and um, it goes on your tongue. So it goes over your. So it's headphones and then like a thing that you put in your mouth on top of your tongue. The headphones deliver a kind of like calibrated sound to the ears of somebody suffering from tinnitus. And then the palate on the tongue delivers like very, very subtle electrical um, pulses. So uh, pretty crazy. Uh, it, it, it's not like they just like, you know, this like wacky sort of Willy Wonka style, you know, um, totally, you know, pie in the sky type of idea. It's, ba it's a, a condition or a condition, a, um, a platform called bimodal neuromodulation. And it, basically the goal is to pretty much just distract you. It's like to, to retrain your brain such that you just don't pay as much attention to the ringing in your ear. Um, hey, Thaki, welcome. Can you explain the Mandela effect? Sure, well, I, the short answer is no, I can't. Um, but for anybody that's not familiar with the Mandela effect, Mandela effect, um, it is named because there was, actually, I think I might have a, a list of examples. Let's see if I do. Uh, but I don't think I do. That's too bad. Oh, wait, no, man. Ah, that's too bad. Um, anyways, so it's named because back in the 90s, um, a huge contingent of people had developed the, uh, the belief that uh, Nelson Mandela, the former president of uh, South Africa and extraordinarily important figure, had died. Everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of people thought that he had died. Um, and it turned out that when he did actually die, many, many years later, which was a, a you know, global affair, uh, world leaders from all over the world went um, to pay their respects. Everybody was like, wait a second, what? I thought he was dead. <laughs> and no, he was not. And so it's sort of this like mass kind of delusion. And it's, it's, that's only, so that's what it's named for. But there are other examples. Like there is this, and there's like a whole subculture devoted to this. Like um, you might've heard of the Berenstein Bears, or the Berenstein Bears. Um, evidently, there's a huge number of people who who just know that they had that their Berenstein Bears book was spelled in a different way, uh, and uh, but they were just wrong. But like a, a really large contingent of people are of that belief, um, and there are other examples. I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, another one that's pretty funny is um, there is this large group of people 
who think that there was a movie called, I think, Kazam, that was played by um, Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> and uh, and it just, it wasn't, it's just not true. But, like, people are, like, adamant, like, no, I saw this movie. It was played by, you know, Shaquille O'Neal. And um, anyways, and, like, this whole subculture, like, people devote significant time to going out and trying to find, like, VHS tapes with the cover, you know, suggesting that this, this uh, movie did exist. Uh, which it didn't, <laughs> and uh, so um, there is no like, like fully confident explanation for why this happens. But I think it's it's fair to acknowledge. Um, oh no, wait, maybe it was Shazam. I'm, I'm thinking because th I think there was a movie called Kazam that was played by um, Sinbad, I believe, um, or whatever. It was some combination of of these kinds of things, um, and. Uh, so there's a subculture that, that is devoted to like, you know, hunting for these, you know, evidence of their diluted belief. And so there's no like, like particularly uh, uh, effective explanation for this other than the fact that I think we can all recognize that our brains, our psychology is fallible, it's extremely fallible. We make mistakes all the time and we're very, very social primates. In fact, there's strong uh, evolutionary evidence to suggest that the only reason we have this big fancy brain with all these capabilities, so many more capabilities than essentially any other mammal, let alone any other, any other animals, because we needed to, because we're not very strong. Um, we have pretty good endurance, but you know, there are animals that are, have greater endurance. Um, and we're not very, very fast. We're kind of fast, but you know, not as fast as most prey. So we all had to basically work together, or like groups of homo sapiens had to work together to go hunt down prey and they had to work with each other right and they had to you know develop sort of complicated social um organizations to feed themselves and so as a result we are both we both have you know very um uh our, our consciousness is uh, very good at recognizing patterns in in our environment um though just because we can recognize patterns doesn't mean that that pattern seeking activity is accurate 100 percent of the time also, we are very easily influenced by our, you know, surrounding primates. And so um, the, the notion that we would be uh, vulnerable to making mistakes like this um, strikes me as totally unsurprising. Uh, but it's not like there's, at least I have not seen any um, studies that like take a group of people who all suffer from, it's not a particularly debilitating condition, but, you know, deal with this Mandela effect or experience it. It's not like there's a study that gathers them all together, puts them in an fMRI or something like that, and then detects this difference, perhaps, that would indicate that they're more vulnerable to the Mandela effect than, than other people. Um, rather, I think it's just, you know, a, um, uh, what is it called? A, uh, ah, gosh, I always forget this word. It's a great word. But anyways, it's just, it's a manifestation of the fact that we have this very, very uh, versatile consciousness, very socially organ um, oriented consciousness, and um, we are also prone to making error. Is NeuroTracker 3D good for the brain? I'm not sure what that device is. The, the name does sound familiar, but I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with it. I'm sorry to say. Um, okay. Hooray, my periscope is working now. Oh, okay, that's good. Um, wait, there wasn't? <laughs> uh, the movie was actually one I experienced before the Mandela, before, before Mandela talk, and I talked about the movie. Yeah, I mean, listen, there are people who are adamant about their, what, you know, others would call their Mandela effect. Um, so, you know, far be it for me to try and prove you wrong, but this is a sort of recognized phenomenon in, in humans. Um, okay. Yeah, Shazam is that, that new one. Yeah, honestly, there, there's a bunch of, um, similar kind of movie titles. I noticed interviews with some scientists and others with head tilted to one side a lot. Significant? Left, right brain? Oh, you mean like, like oftentimes when, sci when a scientist will speak, they'll just sort of be like, you know, head cocked? Uh, I, I can't say no for sure, but um, generally speaking, okay, well, let, let's, let's play with this topic a little bit. So, um, as I was saying, you know, humans are incredibly social primates, um, arguably the most social. And as a result, we evolved to be extraordinarily, exquisitely sensitive to various nonverbal uh, communications. 
And so, and particularly certain parts of the body, so particularly um, sensitive to the disposition, orientation of the eyes and eyebrows. In fact, there's some really wacky um, studies out there that suggest that you can um, intuit a lot about a given person just by guessing and just by only looking at a picture of a person's face. Um, and I talked about this on, on, the, on my podcast called Wired to be Weird uh, in the context of people being able to, you know, better than chance, predict a person's um, political party, political affiliation, and whether or not they will win their election by just looking at black and white pictures of their faces. Um, and it gets into like, oh, well, you know, humans are notoriously bad at explaining why we believe certain things or why we, you know, enacted certain behaviors. But, you know, oftentimes the explanations were like, well, you know, this face looks a little bit more, like a little bit stronger, a little bit more powerful, and this face looks a little bit more empathetic and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I get into that. But, but anyways, we are super sensitive to these types of, um, you know, nonverbal cues. You know, if I'm like, if I'm like looking at you like this from across a room, you know, you might sort of feel like, hey, what's going on with this guy? Is he like about to attack me or something? Or if I'm just like, you know, like that, maybe you'll think I'm on MDMA. <laughs> I don't know. You know, you'll, it's just I'm, I'm conveying a different uh, mood, you know, internal mood state, right? Um, and so, uh, so, so all of this to say we are indeed very sensitive to things like body language and, you know, uh, uh, facial, um, um, uh, you know, expressions, things like that. Um, and in fact, there are regions of the brain that are largely devoted to facial perception. And, and when it goes wrong, you can have something called face blindness or prosopagnosia, where people just have a very difficult, and, and there's sort of like, a, 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 there's a spectrum of severity here from I'm just like really bad at remembering faces to I literally cannot understand or perceive your face. Like, it's not that I can't see it, but it means nothing to me. I, I can make no sense of it. Um, Okay, so we're sensitive to all these nonverbal cues, and they do correspond to various internal states. However, there is a lot of, um, let's just say, there's, there's a lot of claims that are made based off of facial expression, body language, stuff like that, that's really not based in science. Um, it's sort of uh, uh, loosely based on that biology, but there's no like rigorously um, identified, characterized, sort of dictionary of body language that, you know, can reveal various internal states. And so when you say, like, I see a lot of interviews of scientists who tilt their head to one side, and maybe that's indicative of some kind of brain activity that's more common among scientists. Scientists have to be very analytical, um, also very creative. We don't get enough credit for that. But, um, and so perhaps, you know, generally speaking, it might be the case that people who are more analytical and, and so on, meticulous and, and you know, so on, uh, maybe there that corresponds to a tendency to want to, you know, to tilt your head to one side when you're thinking scientifically. There's really no good reason to believe that that's the case, um, that there would be any kind of, you know, anatomical connection to a, a profession in that way. Um, also, you know, I say that scientists have to be analytical. Oh, a lot of different kinds of people uh, uh, are scientists. It's, it's a very, very diverse field. Um, you know, I feel like you have people who are extraordinarily gifted at computation and math, and then you have people like me who are not. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so th it, it's not this, uh, I think it's not as, as consistent as you might intuitively expect. Um, we're highly suggestible, indeed. Um, there are there are a large group of people who think Ian used to have short hair. I did used to have short hair. In fact, I had, um, you know, I haven't had my hair cut in like, well, I guess basically since uh, March, since uh, COVID. Um, yeah, I used to have spiky hair. That was a, an intentional decision when I had uh, my daughter, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, a bit over a year and a half ago, because I was still having to go into the lab every now and then. and. If you have short hair like that, you can look as though you intentionally have it disheveled, even though really it's because you haven't taken a shower. <laughs> uh, okay, it's consciousness part of the frontal cortex. Evolver man, I like that handle. So um, the short answer is yes. Uh, consciousness is part of the, the frontal uh, cortex or the frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex. Um, the frontal lobe is not just the prefrontal cortex just want to acknowledge that, but uh, not that you were suggesting it, I was sort of suggesting it, and uh, that's not the case. But consciousness is a very complicated 
and a, a property of the brain that emerges from a very disparate network of brain regions, not just any one specific brain region. So the point being that, um, and before I move on, because of that, because this disparate network of brain regions all sort of collaborate to generate um, consciousness, if you damage, you know, lesion, um, or you know, one of them, or one of them begins to deteriorate due to some neurodegenerative condition like Alzheimer's disease or something like you know, Parkinson's disease, then you will that will correspond to some component of consciousness that likewise deteriorates or or is you know diminished in some way. Um, so it's not just the frontal cortex; it's the you know the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain uh, that all uh, contribute to it. Now, I think one can make a strong argument that, in, at least in the case of human consciousness, some brain regions are more sort of fundamentally critical than others. Um, so the frontal cortex is a great example where without a frontal cortex, you know, human behavior, human consciousness would be pretty fundamentally different and in, different in a way that would be overt, like an overt departure from normal human consciousness, or at least what we've come to expect as being normal. Um, and, you know, one of the classic examples of this is Phineas Gage. If you ever step foot into a neuroscience lab, you are obligated to hear the story. <laughs> it's like ridiculous that, you know, we don't have other examples, but it is a pretty you know fun example. This guy was working on a railroad, you know, at, at the time they had to, everything was ex pretty much exclusively manual. And so he was working with this iron tamping rod and they had this whole situation where they were using gunpowder to do something. And he was, you know, shoving down his tamping rod and some of that gunpowder ignited and it sent that rod right through his frontal lobe. I think specifically his left frontal lobe, um, through basically through his eye <laughs> and like through his frontal lobe, boom, flies off, dun, 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 falls far away. And he, of course, also, boom, <laughs> flies off, lands on the ground, and then gets pretty much right back up, and he's fine. Um, miracle. That's amazing. This dude just had a giant tamping rod go through his forebrain. Um, before this accident, he was a pretty, um, you know, uh, ethical person. He was not promiscuous. He didn't... He wasn't uh, uh, too libatious. <laughs> he, he didn't drink very much. He didn't get, you know, engage in gambling or, or you know, that, that kind of thing. But after the accident, he fundamentally changed. Everybody around him said things like, Gage is no longer Gage. That, you know, his, his behavior, he turned into a completely different person. And so he, he was still able to be conscious, <laughs> right? He could still walk, he could still talk, he could still engage with his environment, but his consciousness, while still preserved, um, was fundamentally altered, and that's because he lost that one part of the brain. Or not, it wasn't just one part of the brain, but he, he experienced a severe uh, um, damage to, to that part of the brain. So, so no parallel universe. I'm not the person to ask, but I, whenever I see parallel universes or the multiverse, you know, sort of framework um, invoked to explain any aspect of human consciousness, there's essentially always a better um, explanation in neuroscience available. So, you know, things like deja vu. Sometimes I've heard some physicists suggest that maybe that's an example of the membranes of the various universes, like blooding into each other. And deja vu is this experience of your parallel universe self, something that you didn't personally experience, but your parallel universe self experienced. Um, Maybe, but we have much better ex uh, explanations that sort of are more what we call parsimonious, that are, uh, comport more with the neuroscience that we know today, uh, based in you know hard neuroscientific uh, research. So, um, so yeah. Usually, whenever I see parallel universes uh, playing any kind of role in neuroscience conversation, it's because of a deficit of understanding of the things that we do already understand uh, in neuroscience. Uh, what are your thoughts on frequencies and five G? Well, the short story is I'm looking forward to it. Um, faster internet, I'm all for it. <laughs> um, so, so if you'll permit me to um, infer a little bit on, on you bringing up that topic. So um, 5G, just so everybody's on the same page, you, chances are very low that you haven't heard about 5G recently uh, in the past few months. 5G is essentially, it's a form of electromagnetic radiation that falls along the electromagnetic spectrum, the EM spectrum. Uh, Includes things like gamma rays, X rays, microwaves, cellular, you know, signals, um, you know, these types of things, and visible light. Uh, so visible light, you know, red, green, blue, right? Uh, different photons traveling at different wavelengths at the speed of light, as photons do, and uh, 
we would have no idea that that part of the EM spectrum exists were it not for the specialized proteins that, that evolved to be sensitive to that very specific small sliver of the EM spectrum, visible light. Otherwise, you literally would have zero notion that this was even a thing. Uh, just like you aren't really aware of you know, uh, radio waves traveling around you. You can't feel them. They just move around you and you have no uh, uh, available um, uh, mechanism with which you can be sensitive to, to microwaves or, or uh, to uh, radio waves. Um, so when it comes to 5G, 5G is just like a new, uh, 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 another sliver of the EM spectrum. And just like with a bunch of other parts of the EM spectrum, there's really no reason to believe and no evidence that it interacts with our biology in any meaningful way. To do so, it would have to be able to, the physical properties of those waves would have to be such that they could do things like, you know, interact with some protein, you know, proteins are, are very wiggly little things. And depending on how they, what, what they're wiggling like, you can get different uh, outcomes. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, that's that's what the case is in, in visible light, where you have this EM you know radiation that interacts with this protein and changes its structure, and then you can see you know a sunset. Um, so you know there's no evidence to believe that you know cellular uh, the cellular range or you know 5G, 4G, whatever has those physical properties, and there's no evidence that it does either. So um, so that that's what I think about it. You know, and it, but hey, you know if and, and, and the problem with this di discussion about 5G is that I see a lot of people making claims that are purely speculative, you know, talking, speaking of, of pattern seeking, right, where it's like, you know, um, speculative, like, you know, we see this 5G tower in this area and all these other things have happened and therefore they're somehow connected. That's just not science, right? You have to, you have to come up with a hypothesis and then try and disprove that hypothesis um, and present evidence. So the moment that somebody actually presents evidence that 5G is a meaningful concern, believe me, I'll be right there with you in, in being concerned about it. I have a daughter, very young daughter. Her biology is extraordinarily dynamic right now. She's developing. If there, I would never want to expose her to something dangerous. So I, I have every incentive in the, in the world, and I'm certainly not paid by anybody that's even closely uh, uh, remotely associated with, with any kind of 5G technology. So um, believe me, I'm, I'm your ideal case of a scientist who's open-minded and willing to accept new evidence. But the problem with this discussion is that there is no evidence yet. So uh, we're, exposed, we're exposed to radiation every day. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, oh man, I forgot about your podcast. The episode I did listen to was so good. Oh, thank you very much, Dark Swan. Brains look really weird. Yes, they do. They very much so do. Han shot first. I have a great self-control. I said nothing. <laughs> um, can you explain where jaw pain and headaches related to it starts? Sure. Um, yeah, well... I'm, I'm trying to, there was a, I think a study, uh, yeah, well, uh, anyway, so, yeah, I mean, so, so stuff like TMJ or, you know, um, other, you know, manifestations of, of jaw pain, generally speaking, uh, not always, but uh, can be associated with some kind of aberrant activity in something called the tr uh, trigeminal nerve. Uh, which is basically this nerve that is you know, associated with the face in many ways. Um, different things can go wrong with the, with the uh, trigeminal nerve. Uh, for example, trigeminal neuralgia, where people experience this dramatic, incredible burning-like sensation on their face. Extraordinarily damage or, or um, debilitating, but it's not based on any kind of damage to the face. It's not like their face is actually on fire. Um, and so, you know, that kind of pain can be associated with the, with the trigeminal nerve. Thank you so much for the super hearts, Joy. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, headaches related to it, yeah. So I mean, similar story, right? So so these, um, I should say, you know, if you're experiencing this, you should go talk to a physician about this. There are some treatments in, in for some of these um, manifestations of you know trigeminal activity, and there's other ways that one can experience this kind of pain. But these um, these structures sort of uh, um, are proximal to each other, and um, you know. Uh, there, of course, are things like tension headaches um, that, that can be relieved by various um, treatments. Um, and so, but generally speaking, I, you know, I'm, no, I'm not a physician, I'm a scientist, but that would probably be where I would look first is like, you know, is there something odd, something unique about this person's trigeminal nerve? Um, okay, brains look like cottage cheese, a little bit, a little bit. I am working with um, unfair management since long 
and can't have another job, so how will this affect my brain? Well, I'm sorry to hear that, um, and you're not alone. Uh, I, I hope that situation resolves soon. Um, there's a bunch of different things. I mean, and uh, it's a very complicated topic, but, um, you know, something like learned helplessness, where if you're working for somebody who's abusive, um, and no matter what you do, you can never obtain, there's no recourse, there's no kind of way for you to solve this problem. Animals throughout the entire animal kingdom, um, with, you know, meaningful consciousnesses, uh, can exhibit something called learned helplessness. And in fact, it's a model for depression in animal research. And, um, there's a kind of a corollary in humans where um, one can develop, you know, uh, depression and, or, you know, or if, if a, you know, one of these, these colleagues is particularly abusive, you know, uh, uh, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, and how will that affect your brain in many ways? Um, you know, everything from certain regions of the brain losing volume, uh, not, neurons not dying, but just they're not as connected with, with other neurons in the brain as they would otherwise. Uh, hippocampal volumes uh, uh, have been shown to be lower in people with severe depression. Um, yeah, uh, uh, there have been studies that suggest that there's an inflammatory process, an, an, like an immune system related process associated with depression, where if you literally infuse inflammatory molecules, some of the same kinds of molecules that are, you know, will uh, present themselves when you're exposed to something like COVID-19 uh, or SARS-CoV-2, the virus, uh, can be elevated in people with depression. Um, and, you know, there's a bunch, uh, you, you know, in terms of, you know, psych uh, psychologically, it can be, you know, develop ch chronic anxiety, chronic stress. Um, it can affect your metabolism uh, where, you know, um, you just absorb nutrients in a sort of deficient way. Um, it can, of, of course, affect your appetite in, in a variety of ways. It can make you want to eat more. It can make you want to eat less. It can affect your sleep schedule. So, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's a non-trivial concern. Um, and, uh, you know, I wish there was something we could do about it um, for, on your behalf. But I hope it uh, resolves sometime soon. Microexpressions, are they a legit thing? Yeah, I was just sort of talking about that Han, Han shot first. Um, so, so, I mean, yes. They, like, very... As I was saying, right, as highly social primates, we're, you know, exquisitely sensitive to facial expressions when speaking, right? That's why I think it's, it's valuable for you to be able to see me, my face, as I'm talking about these subjects, particularly subjects that are perhaps a little bit more like hot potato-y, <laughs> because you can see my face. And, you know, humans did not evolve to only hear each other. Um, although we, we can communicate that way, it's just not as, it doesn't, it's not as nutritious <laughs> a form of communication. Um, and so, uh, so there's something to that. However, um, there's also a lot of pseudoscience in the world of microexpressions where it's like, if this person raises their eyebrow like that, that means that they're trying to think of some, you know, untruth. Um, or if they, you know, look off to this side, that means that they're, you know, about to lie or they're, or they're, or they're trying to think of the answer, right? There's, I've never seen any kind of meticulously executed science that actually demonstrates any of that. Um, so, yeah. Um, where's that thing? Where did that thing run off to? Uh, boop, boop. Or maybe boop, boop. Boop, boop. Oops. Of course. Duh. Um, okay, sorry about this. This is super awkward, isn't it? Uh, oh, Dark Swan. Thank you so much. I appreciate the super hearts. Um, Okay, so now let's go back to this. Sorry, everybody. Brain, yes, brain. Uh, math is overrated. Sometimes a person looks very nice, but as if you feel that he is not who he seems, it's in fact that. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, when you need a head shunt replaced, is it really okay to, ha to leave the old tubing in? Dandelion flower, that's really a question for, for a physician. Um, how's my baby girl? She's doing great, thank you very much. <laughs> Her new thing is, uh, she's a very clever little baby. Uh, her new thing is when she's eating uh, something messy, you know, she gets food on her face. Um, she'll like, you know, signal me over to, to want to give me a hug. She like reaches her hands out. I'm like, of course, I want to give you a hug. Hugging babies is the best. But then she's clearly just wanted to wipe her face on my stomach, <laughs> which is clever. And I appreciate a baby, uh, you know, prioritizing cleanliness. But I wish you would come up with, you know, how to use a napkin or something like that. Um, but yeah, she's doing great. Um, thank you for asking, Tracy. Um, uh, affecting the brain with nine volt battery. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, I would not recommend putting a nine volt battery into your brain. 
There's just not a lot of space for it. And, it, you know, there's really no need for it. Your brain, your neurons have oodles and oodles of their own little batteries. Uh, they're not really batteries, they're more like power stations called mitochondria. Uh, probably one of the most important evolutionary moments in the history of humanity was when one organism engulfed a mitochondria that was just out on its own doing its own thing, and instead of destroying it, they began working together. Without that, we wouldn't have anything remotely as complicated as we see now. Um, what is a brain scientist? Okay. Uh, a brain scientist is, well, the reason I use the word brain scientist is that that is what the field is, basically, at least in my domain of the field. Um, we usually use the term neuroscientist in uh, the United States. Most other countries, or certainly English-speaking countries, also use that term, but, you know, different countries have different languages, right? Um, but what it is, is it's a scientist, one who uses the scientific method to ask questions about how consciousness works, how the brain works, how the nervous system works, and then um, does experiments to test, to try and disprove their hypothesis. Um, and uh, more often than not, we're wrong. <laughs> but every now and then, it looks like we were right. And uh, as a result, we sort of push, we contribute to the fund of human knowledge. And um, so what I did in my, uh, uh, for my PhD was I thought that this circuit within the brain that's very evolutionarily ancient, it's what we call conserved, um, be, and we know that because it's in a whole slew of other animals, some, some of which are very distantly evolutionarily re related to humans, like fish, for example, um, that we know this circuit is involved in the withdrawal syndrome that people experience when they've been drinking for a long time, smoking cigarettes for a long time, or vaping, uh, doing, you know, using opioids like morphine or oxycodone. Um, for a long time when they stop, they experience this withdrawal syndrome. And there's good reason to believe that this structure, there's evidence supporting that this structure is involved in ne the manifestation of those withdrawal experiences. Um, and so my question was first, trying to understand a little bit more about the nature of this circuit, like what, are, what kinds of neurons are in this brain region and what kinds of neurons are they, um, are they you know, speaking to in this other brain region, um, but then also whether or not this circuit involved in withdrawal from uh, addictive drugs, it might also be involved in anxiety, um, independently of, of drug addiction and, and withdrawal. Um, okay, so uh, psychologists can be neuroscientists, certainly. Uh, psychology is, of course, its own field, um, but obviously, you know, the, in most cases, the, the primary uh, goal is to understand more about human consciousness. And so, you know, psychology is a fabulous tool to, um, you know, scrutinize human consciousness at a, a sort of global level, right, of, you know, psychological output or experiences rather than, you know, the activities of specific neurons or circuits of neurons, which is what I did. Um, so, yeah. Um, all right. Deja vu is a glitch in the matrix before you figure this one out, guys. Um, it kind of is, sort of, a little bit. Uh, so I have a podcast episode on, or actually two, I think, on Deja Vu. Deja Vu is very, very cool. I used to get questions about Deja Vu all the time. It was like, it was up there with like, is, you know, cannabis bad for you? Uh, do we only use 10% of our brains? And then there was like, what is Deja Vu? Dude, what's Deja Vu? Um, and uh, so I did a podcast episode on it. I didn't think it was going to be very interesting because I didn't uh, realize how much actually reasonably good research there is into it. The short story is that Deja Vu is just sort of a, um, not a mistake, but a, a, a byproduct of a certain pattern of brain activity in certain brain regions. And the reason that we can be fairly confident that this is the case is because we can induce it. We can induce it in multiple ways. For example, if somebody has uh, epilepsy and they need to have uh, brain surgery to treat their epilepsy, maybe to lesion some neurons or, you know, uh, um, reduce the ability of different brain regions to communicate with one another very frequently in the temporal lobe, um, what sometimes uh, the, a person in that position will be asked, hey, would you mind if we did a little bit of science with you while you're, uh, while you're having this surgery? It won't hurt you. It'll just make the surgery last a little bit longer, but we'll learn a lot because there's nothing better, if you understand human consciousness, than studying the human brain. But it's kind of tough to study the human brain because I would like to keep my brain inside of my skull. Thank you very much. Uh, and so it can be kind of difficult to get, you know, to actually directly probe the human brain. Um, and so... What has been shown is that somebody who's undergoing brain surgery, if a neurosurgeon takes an, an electrode and just 
subtly zaps. It's not really zaps. Subtly, you know, stimulates a part of the brain called the medial temporal lobe. Um, so it's sort of like right around here, sort of. Um, they can induce deja vu. Um, there's that. There's also, for people who have, again, epilepsy, um, and just so you, you know, everybody understands, epilepsy is a condition where uh, neurons begin firing at, at, you know, aberrant frequencies and patterns of, of activity. Uh, and, you know, very frequently people um, associate epilepsy with, with convulsant epilepsy, where people are rhythmically contracting their muscles. Um, but there's a bunch of different forms or manifestations of epilepsy, and one of them is this, you know, consistent, powerful deja vu that they'll experience. And generally speaking, those people, their seizures emerge from that same part of the brain, the medial temporal lobe. Um, certain drugs can induce deja vu, uh, and, and on and on we go, but basically that's what it seems to be. It's like, you know, memory is this complicated process. Deja vu is sort of at its simplest. It is the, the perception of familiarity in the absence of any actual memory. So you, you feel like this thing, this person, this experience is familiar, even though you know that you don't actually have a memory of this happening. And so, you know, deja vu may, may teach us that familiarity detection and like hard, straight up memory are distinct pro processes that interact with one another. Uh, but in every now and then familiarity can be triggered in the absence of, of memory. Whereas generally speaking, memory is what triggers um, uh, uh, familiarity. Um, what drugs can induce deja vu? So the short story, it seems, is drugs that have some kind of serotonergic activity, meaning drugs that alter serotonin levels in some way. Um, so, you know, we know psychedelics, for example, these are uh, drugs that induce a, a certain kind of category of hallucinations, um, oftentimes visual, but not exclusively. They, the, the kind of most important component of their pharmacological activity is serotonergic, meaning they bind serotonin receptors, they change the way serotonin, the neurotransmitter serotonin, is trafficked between synapse or, or um, you know, between neurons in synapse, synaptic clefts. <laughs> um, and so we know there's that. There's also uh, uh, sort of um, case studies of people who had some kind of infection. Um, and I go, I go into this on the podcast. I like read this, per or actually these two people's accounts. Um, they were treated with some kind of antibiotic that is known to have some serotonergic activity. And what happened was they, they were being treated for this, or you know, for this infection with this drug. Uh, they, they take the drug. <laughs> uh, and all of a sudden, their, their friend calls them and says, hey, we have to go pick up our kids from school because blah, blah, blah happened and they need to come home. And the person who took the, the medication is like, why do you keep telling me this? Like, you already told me this. And she, and she gets kind of angry. Um, and, uh, and she sort of knew that, like, my friend had not told me this. It's sort of this really surreal account. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, so, generally speaking, drugs that, that um, induce uh, or have some kind of serotonin activity. Um, okay, why are tiny amounts of lysergic acid so potent? That's a great question, Evolver Man. It's like some straight-up pharmacology. So, basically, when it comes to, you know, what, what is it that... that um, identifies the potency. Well, what we're talking about is potency and efficacy, okay? Um, and there are other, like, affinity, avidity. There's, like, a bunch of different terms that, that are used to describe how it is that a molecule binds a receptor, binds a protein of some sort. And so, um, you know, it probably it's no news to you that some drugs are significantly more potent than others. You know, LSD or acid, lysergic acid diethylamide, which is LSD, is significantly more potent than, um, let's say, psilocybin. Uh, psilocybin is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, for example. Um, and when I say it's more potent, you only need micrograms, very, very low concentrations of LSD to induce pretty severe altered states of consciousness, severely altered states of consciousness, whereas you need like milligrams of psilocybin to do the same. So orders of magnitude difference. So what is it that distinguishes that? Well, it depends on, so um, all of these drugs have any kind of psychoactive activity because they have some capability due to their molecular structure. They have, you know, uh, atoms that, um, you think of it sort of as let, like, you know, a structure with magnets on the end, right? And depending upon the orientation of a magnet, it'll either repulse from another magnet or it'll bind to that other magnet. And so you can imagine this sort of like, you know, scaffolding with magnets on the ends. And then a protein is very similar. It's just sort of like a scaffolding with magnets, you know, uh, arranged in various ways. And depending upon the structure of that molecule, 
you can have a bunch of magnets, uh, you know, bind each other and, and they're, they're, they bind each other very tightly, or they just sort of kind of barely interact, you know, like maybe one of the magnets, you know, it's, it's kind of held far away from the protein due to the structure of the molecule, but there's still some, you know, interaction there. The first one would be significantly more potent because it's binding that protein extraordinarily, uh, uh, very strongly. Um, whereas the second would have some kind of activity, but it, you would you know, need a whole lot more of those instances to achieve the same level. So um, that's, that's a very, very sort of um, uh, the layman's kind of explanation for uh, potency. Um, another uh, uh, component of this, and this is like, this is like intro pharmacology stuff, but um, is depending, so, so you have how strongly a molecule binds to a protein, but then also what happens to the protein when that molecule binds. Right? Does it just bind the protein and then the protein doesn't really change or do anything different? Or when it binds, does it actually contort the protein? Does it actually move the protein to bind? Um, and a drug like LSD does the second one. Right? It, it binds and it induces this very significant change in the protein, whereas another molecule, it binds, but it doesn't really change what the protein is doing very, very much. Um, so that's, that's uh, uh, efficacy. Um, yeah, so that's why. Uh, you, you look a bit like Mac from It's Always Sunny. Yeah, not the first person to tell me that. <laughs> uh, can tacos make you smarter? Yes, for sure. Um, particularly if you're not eating anything else. <laughs> um, because you need food, right? Not because tacos have some kind of magic ingredient. Um, okay. Uh, would you be so kind to do a scope on personality disorders and neurobiology and how they relate? I, I, I could try. Maybe I'll, I'll do something like that on, on YouTube. Um, sent you the big 90. Oh, thank you so much for the super heart dark swan. That's really generous of you. I, I really appreciate it, particularly these days. Thank you, Honest Aces, for the super heart. Appreciate it, man. Are you aware of the mind control techniques used by the government and FBI that are highly illegal? Well, um, I don't know if you're referring to any specific uh, ongoing program, but there's an excellent book, and I'm putting the cover up on, on YouTube called Poisoner in Chief by a journalist slash um, a historian. I think he teaches at Brown University right now, former New York Times reporter. Um, he's written some of the most interesting books on sort of the history of various aspects of government, but this one is about the pursuit of mind control platforms by the CIA in the United States. Um, and it's all based off of, he, he really focuses on this one specific person within the CIA who is basically like their chemist, their, their chief chemist. Uh, and you might've heard of MK MKUltra. Uh, if you're a real nerd, you might've heard of uh, Operation Arctic Choke. Uh, or if you're a real nerd, you might've heard of Midnight Climax, which is my personal favorite. <laughs> um, and these are things that really happened, right? They, like some of these stories came out of the church committee hearings, uh, you know, in the Senate. But this is decades ago, right? In like the 50s, 60s. And, um, but, and, and also some of it came out subsequently um, that, you know, these were projects that, that um, were, were pursued because there was this tremendous concern and genuine fear that the Soviet Union, the, you know, the, main, the primary enemy at the time, um, had developed something like this, had developed some kind of uh, mind control device. And it all comes from this one uh, example of like people who had like defected to the, the USSR or they had defected to North Korea or something like that. And at the time, the only explanation that they could, you know, could they, that they could conjure was they had somehow developed mind control. And so we got to develop mind control. And of course, at the time, there was this tremendous interest in psychedelics. It's like this new sort of family of drugs, not really that new. I mean, they had been synthesized decades prior, but it was new toward, sort of to like academic science. Um, LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, right? Um, and these were also a tremendously unique category of drugs, right? And so you had people like, you know, Tim Leary, Timothy Leary, uh, or John C. Lilly. At the time, th these were highly regarded scientists, very, very creative. John C. Lilly, uh, sort of, of early pioneer of the sensory deprivation tank, he primarily took a drug called ketamine, but he also experimented uh, every, like they all did at that time. Um, but anyways, yeah, so um, basically, I, it, I recommend this book, uh, put it back up, uh, this book because he's a great writer and he's, you know, um, a pretty well-regarded historian. He's not just sort of like, you know, going on like internet forums and reading about it. Um, oh, and I should say that the, per the guy I was, that he focuses on is a guy named Sidney Gottlieb, 
Um, and the story's crazy. This this guy, like he not only he purchased through the CIA all of what was it? It was like Sandoz Pharmaceutical. I think it was Sandoz. All of their LSD, all of it, <laughs> for like something like two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. Where you know today it would be worth millions and millions of dollars. Um, because they had nothing to do with like what are we going to do with all this lsd that we have um and uh anyways so uh there's these crazy crazy stories um and so i don't know if you're referring to anything like that like back in the day where that definitely did happen oh and by all the way by the way another crazy thing so sydney gottlieb would, would you know work with all these psychedelics and stuff he also synthesized uh toxins like poisons that were used uh, for assassinations and stuff um just crazy crazy stuff uh, he ended up retiring and moving to uh, India, I believe, to work at a leper colony, he and his wife. He also, he lived in a cabin in the middle of the woods, totally off the grid. He made his own yogurt. I think he had farm animals. He, he was just this super weird dude. <laughs> like, not that there's anything weird about that, but that's just not the sort of typical, like, you know, bespoke Ivy League people that filled the halls of the CIA at that time. Like this guy was, he also had a, a peg leg. <laughs> it's just like such a weird character. He works at this leper colony and then he's summoned during the church committee here or during the church hearings uh, to, um, to, to, uh, to ask him a bunch of questions. But the thing is they didn't know what questions to ask because it was all classified. And so Sidney Gottlieb didn't have to really, they didn't, he was never sort of pursued for all of the things he had done. Uh, and he just, he got to, you know, fade away into obscurity until Stephen Kinzer uh, brought him back up. Really, really cool stuff. Uh, and so what I'm saying is, I don't know if you're referring to those types of stories or if you have something specific that's allegedly ongoing today. Um, I'll put it this way. Uh, the CIA came to the conclusion, at least according to all this, that mind, there is no such thing as mind control. Not only that, but the USSR had not developed mind control. Um, and so they abandoned like those projects. Uh, also, they were obviously profoundly unethical. <laughs> so there was that problem. Uh, but you know, it, the book does kind of leave you like, hey, what what are they doing now? You know, <laughs> like what what is you know? Are they still working on this? Um, I'm skeptical that they would, uh, just because they probably have more effective strategies that don't involve like mind control to achieve what they want. But um, uh, uh, and also, uh, well, yeah. Anyways, I could go on, and on, but from what I understand, there is no such platform, uh, and certainly from from the perspective of neuroscience, there is no such platform. Um, does Trump have a brain? Yes, he does. I have a brain. Um, and thank you very much, Sherry, for the super heart. I appreciate it. Good to see you, by the way. Yeah, well, totally crazy book. You know, highly recommend. It. It's just so much fun. I like. I read it. I think we had gone on a. Tr- trip to my wife's parents house or something like that and I had to come back early and I, I almost read it all just on my commute to like come back to Philly and when I got back I recommended it to everybody in the lab <laughs> and uh, even like a new student who had just joined a new grad student who had just joined our lab I was like hey and she's in the pharmacology department I was like hey you got to read this book and she was like okay okay and she came back like you know a week and a half later like this is crazy <laughs> so you should check it out um, yeah read the book read the book book poisoner in chief by stephen kinzer thank you so much date appreciate that oh uh somebody's calling in well let's see oh cool oh, no bingo uh, okay chris it looks like we're connected uh chris in san francisco what's on your mind i i totally agree with you comrade sure i'll take my check later on So um, I assume you're referring to nootropics. Um, and uh, okay, Th- this is kind of a cool topic because, so first of all, um, nootropics as a category of supplements, um, stuff like that, I don't, I'm not familiar with this specific one, um, but if it were quite effective, I, I'm sure I would be. Um, I'm sure it would have hit my radar. But um, generally speaking, nootropics is, is a, it's like a theoretical category of you know, vitamins and minerals and, and molecules that in some way, shape or form improve brain function. 
or improve intelligence or memory or, or you know some component. This was a theoretical category of supplements that was devised in the 70s um, by actually I, th I think a Russian scientist. Uh, That's a pretty good accent, by the way. Uh, but but it was theoretical. It was like you know um, there is reason to believe that these molecules might or very likely do exist, and so we should devote resources to finding out what they are. Um, and very soon thereafter, um, molecules like uh, uh, paracetam, you know, oxiracetam, uh, uh, pramuracetam, there's a whole family of racetam molecules um, that are actually much more commonly used in um, you know, Eastern Europe and in Russia to treat um, hypoxia, actually. Um, but uh, in you know, other countries, um, they are often marketed as nootropics. That's like the sort of the, the poster molecule of uh, nootropics. But there's a bunch of other ones. There's like, you know, phosphatidylcholine, um, theanine is sometimes described as one, bacopamoniary, um, uh, ginkgo biloba, uh, vinpocetine. There, there's, there's like a whole bunch. Antioxidants just has like a whole category oftentimes marketed as nootropics. So here's the problem with nootropics. There is some evidence to suggest that some of these molecules can improve a very, very narrow component of intelligence or you know, some behavior that's associated with brain activity um, in a very specific sliver of people. So people who, for example, are over the age of 65, uh, people who um, are at a sleep deficit, or people who are at a nutritional deficit. Um, and so the point is we're talking about people who are not sort of your you know, he healthy, you know, otherwise healthy, you know, reasonably young, like at an age where, um, you know, cognitive impairment isn't typical, you know. Um, we're talking about people who have experienced, you know, are experiencing some kind of deficit, and there's some evidence that these molecules can uh, improve performance uh, in them. But there's no, there's really no evidence, there's no strong evidence that they, or, and I should say also, in the, like, improving, like, a narrow sliver of, of, of conscious or, or intelligence is like their ability to, you know, recall words. Like, like when I say, you know, I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Tell me as many words as you can that start with the letter P. So you just go, 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 go. Um, and, you know, that is a sort of um, a, a metric to evaluate. That is a cognitive process, obviously. And um, so, you know, your one's ability to recall, that's, the, that's what it's called, verbal recall, to recall various words is sensitive to things like sleep, to, um, you know, nutrition, to, to these types of age, um, these types of things. And so um, there's some evidence that like this nootropic, you know, makes it so that the average number of words went from 15 to 18, you know, so it's like, okay, that's technically uh, uh, improvement, but it's not going to get you, you know, a high score on your LSAT or, you know, whatever. It's not like, that's not really what we're talking about here when we're talking about you know cognitive enhancement. Um, okay, so the and and uh, uh, um, I you know I, I say that just because like you know just like with with other sort of um, you know other discourse that kind of sometimes um, blebs into pseudoscience um, or or at least misunderstood science. Um, I'm totally open to, to the notion that there would be molecules that would improve human intelligence um, in a sustainable way uh, or would be, you know, beneficial for people who have, you know, various, you know, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in their mitochondria or in their, you know, uh, dopamine receptors or whatever. I'm totally open to the idea that there would be molecules that for some people, like, ah, this would be ideal if you could take this because it would compensate for the fact that your adenosine receptors are blah, 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 you know. Um, but as of today, there, there is no evidence that any such thing exists. Um, however, there is an interesting domain of research, at least that I find interesting. Um, and I think it's best exemplified by a scientist, very wide, highly regarded scientist, geneticist named David Sinclair, um, who uh, is part of a group of people who um, have been studying longevity, essentially. Uh, mostly in animal models and mostly in very, very simple animal models like, you know, sea elegans or nematodes or worms or, or you know, sometimes mice. Um, they're interested in identifying whether or not certain molecules, namely nicotinamide mononucleotide or nicotinamide riboside, um, extend life. And, and not only extend, like, lifespan, but health span. 
and um, they have a company called Elysium, which is basically, insta and this is a company, the, the board of which is composed of people from MIT and Harvard, um, you know, the serious heavy hitter scientists in longevity research at least. Um, and rather than trying to, you know, go the standard route of developing a pharmaceutical, because of the, the difficulty of longevity research, I mean, think about how you'd have to devise a clinical, an ideal clinical trial to establish whether or not a molecule extends lifespan and health span. I mean, that would take literally decades. <laughs> uh, they, there is a clinical trial that's ongoing right now, but it, it's very limited. It's like, does this molecule, um, you know, improve genetic signatures in people with type 2 diabetes over the course of three years? Because if it does it over three years, then it's probably beneficial over six, you know, 12 years, whatever. Um, but they're, so instead they're selling this as a supplement. And, and it's it's widely regarded as being pretty innocuous, um, you know, benign. Like it doesn't have any significant side effects, at least to date. Um, and so uh, they're selling it as a supplement. They're using the pretty non-trivial revenues, uh, like tens of millions of dollars, to fund its subsequent research. Um, so it might be the case that you know some of these molecules are beneficial, uh, and but we just have yet we just haven't answered the or, or we haven't even asked the questions yet. Um, so that, that's sort of where I'm at. Um, I'm not familiar with which molecule you're talking about. If you said provigil, then some people consider provigil or modafinil as the non, you know, trade name of, of that molecule to be a, a nootropic. Um, I think a lot of that is because, yeah, we shouldn't jump to conclusions for sure. But like, I think a lot of the, the, the modafinil conversation emerges from the fact that initially it was marketed as a essentially a stimulant, um, but a stimulant with completely unique pharmacological properties relative to the sort of standard psychomotor stimulants like amphetamine, methylphenidate. Um, in other words, like it should be non-habit forming or it was marketed to be non-habit forming and not like a dopaminergic, catecholaminergic, uh, meaning like a drug that increases or alters dopamine and norepinephrine signaling primarily. Um, but it turns out that it does, and, and and so it has this all these other pharmacological properties. But um, but it, it also is a sort of just a standard psychomotor stimulant. Um, uh, and by the way, so there is evidence that modafinil, again, provigil or armodafinil, which is um, what is that? I can't remember the the name of the trade name of that. Um, oh, is it like whatever? <laughs> uh, that they improve some cognitive performance, but they also um, degrade some cognitive performance. Um, so, so it's just, it's not like a, if you take, it's not like the, the drug from, um, from Limitless. More in, info on tinnitus. Sure. Uh, so I just went into, you know, so a degree of depth on YouTube, youtube.com slash anthropoid on tinnitus. I, I sort of described some of the basic biology behind it, behind subjective tinnitus and objective tinnitus. Objective tinnitus is pretty crazy. So tinnitus, for anybody that's not familiar, is a condition where uh, a person experiences, for a variety of reasons, this persistent like ringing in their ears, often ringing, but it can also be hissing or, or, or clicking or, you know, like, like static TV sound. Um, or it can be this like rhythmic pulsing, oftentimes associated with some kind of vasculature. Um, but there is a category, a very, very um, less common category of tinnitus uh, uh, of people who are literally hearing an actual sound, right? And so a physician can like poke, a, poke your ear with a stethoscope and they can hear the sound, which is crazy. Um, so the body is actually generating uh, uh, the sound. Uh, but mo far more frequently, it's called subjective tinnitus where people, the only person that can experience this is the person themselves. Like it's not like it's an actual sound. Um, and, you know, I went into some of the really weird biology behind uh, the anatomy that enables us to hear things, but also our sixth sense, the, the sense that doesn't get enough uh, attention. It needs a better PR agent, um, the vestibular system. Uh, it's just crazy evolutionarily. You have these little grains of shell matter that have accumulated in your ear, and it's supposed to be there. Without it, you wouldn't know if you were moving or if your head was tilting. Pretty crazy. Um, but then I went into this new device a clinical trial was published based uh, or from a company based out of Dublin, Ireland called Neuromod Devices, where it's totally non-invasive and um, basically it's this combination of headphones and a little palette that you put on your tongue. So it's Bluetooth headphones uh, and they, they play a certain kind of pattern of, of sound and, um, and then this palette that goes on their tongue that uh, uh, provides very subtle electrical pulses. Um, 
And the whole idea is that this device, and, and so people uh, wore it for about an hour a day for about 12 weeks. Um, and the idea is that you're basically trying to distract the brain, essentially retrain the brain to not focus so much on that auditory signal. And so I go into a bit of the biology behind what, like, what is it that distinguishes, like everybody will experience tinnitus at some point, and a lot of people actually technically would have tinnitus, but it just doesn't bother them. They don't really notice it very much. Um, and uh, so what is it that distinguishes those people? And, um, and so I went into some of that biology. So it's youtube.com slash anthropoid. Um, yeah, I have loud ringing in ear 24-7 for the past few months. There is so many people who have it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, very, it's really quite common. Um, and so it can be done with animals too. Nikola Tesla was working on being able to project thoughts onto a visual screen. Is that possible? Um, so when you say project thoughts onto a visual screen, I mean like that's sort of technically what's happening right now. Right? I'm sort of projecting thoughts through my language onto the screen of your device. Um, there's uh, so there's that. Um, there are some projects out there that have been interested in trying to um, basically use either like fMRI or something you know like fMRI to try and decipher patterns of activity in the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is where the vast majority of your visual processing occurs to decipher patterns of activity there in to try and generate an image, right? So in other words, let's say, you know, I'm looking at a microphone right now, looking at it, looking at it. There is going to be a, a consistent pattern of, elect, uh, of uh, normal activity in my occipital lobe that can theoretically be um, detected by something like an fMRI and then theoretically be deciphered into, you know, this is what this person is looking like. And that can be projected onto a screen. But apart from that, um, there's no reason to believe that there's any part of the brain that has like the capability of broadcasting activity beyond the many ways that we're lucky to be able to do it. Like we have the, these bodies that can physically alter the universe around us. We have, you know, the ability to make sounds that are some that are diverse enough such that we can communicate, you know, very complicated thoughts um, across thousands of miles. Um, so I think it's pretty remarkable, you know, the capabilities that we evolved to have. Um, and so, you know, just because we don't have like a part of the brain that like broadcasts, you know, like uh, pattern master style, like, uh, you know, metaphysically, um, I think is, well, who cares? We have all these other amazing, um, all these amaz other amazing uh, capabilities. What's the name of the company? It's called Neuromod Devices. And uh, they are currently in the process of preparing for a second clinical trial where they're gonna try and alter the frequencies of the sounds the, the, um, and the frequencies of the pulses on the tongue to just sort of see if they can e improve things. I mean, they're, 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 um, the level of reduced symptoms of tinnitus was really remarkable. It was like between 74 and 88 percent of their participants reported some kind of improvement in symptoms, which is really great because there really isn't a treatment for tinnitus. Um, you know, there are like treatments, but they're not really tailored to tinnitus. They're not just to treat tinnitus. They're to treat the, you know, psychiatric uh, uh, burden that can come along with severe tinnitus. Or it's uh, for very severe cases, you know, there are some medications that have been shown to, to help a little bit, but they're, they're not, they're clearly not devised to treat tinnitus. There's also things like, you know, white white noise machines. There's even like, um, which, by the way, if you ever have a baby, get a white noise machine. <laughs> It'll improve your life immeasurably. You'll thank me for the rest of your baby's life, or at least your baby's babyhood. Um, anyways, you can also have basically like a hearing aid, but it's just like a little white noise machine in, in your ear to sort of just drown out um, that, that persistent ringing. And by the way, um, I used to always say tinnitus. Uh, just because, because it, that's what the word looks like, but it actually doesn't look that way. Um, probably the more accurate, like technically, uh, linguistically accurate pronunciation of that word is tinnitus. Tinnitus, that suffix is generally associated with an inflammatory process of some kind due to an infection or something like that. And so um, there isn't necessarily any in, uh, inflammation going on with tinnitus. And so therefore, to remain consistent, and you know, we always try our best to be consistent, right? Uh, tinnitus. Okay. Um, or a very bright light. Could you uh, please explain why my migraines are triggered 
and so bad when I hear loud noises. Yeah, uh, so Bruce Harper. So uh, the short story is we don't really know why it is that sensory activities, sensory experiences can trigger migraines, can trigger headaches. Um, and the reason that it's a little wild is that migraines, although they feel as though they are you know, occurring due to some kind of damage or something like that within the brain, it's actually not. The brain itself doesn't feel pain. Um, it doesn't have the things, the very receptors that are necessary to feel pain. It relies on those receptors outside of the brain to let us know if there's any kind of damage uh, so that we can take some kind of evasive act, right, or uh, measures. So, um, but sensory experiences are all generated within the brain, right? So if, if you, you said very bright lights, right? Yeah, so, you know, bright light would um, trigger activity in the back of the brain, the occipital lobe once again, um, or loud sounds would trigger, you know, activity in the auditory cortex, of course. Um, and, and so you have these patterns of activity within the brain. And so why would, you know, migraines that are, that are thought to largely be generated along the outside of the brain, along, within and around the meninges, uh, the sort of shrink wrapping of the brain, uh, because there are pain receptors there. Um, why would internal activity trigger that? Um, and maybe there is, you know, a recent study that came out that, that um, characterizes it or has identified it, but I have not seen that. Um, so I'm not sure. What we do know is that you're not alone, that people do experience this, as unintuitive as it may be from a scientific perspective. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Do you think martial arts that allow strikes to the head should be illegal? No, for sure not. I mean, just like I don't think alcohol should be illegal. I don't think tobacco should be illegal. Um, but I, I think just like with alcohol, just like with tobacco, uh, people should be able to make their own decisions. But those decisions, you know, we're, we live in a society, right? We, we do our best to, to make the best decisions with the information at our disposal. And so it, I think it's a, the responsibility of scientists, obviously, but also um, governments to make it very, very clear that there are these very significant, definite risks associated with engaging in, you know, these um, substances or engaging in these athletic endeavors, right? Football included, American football included. Um, and, uh, and so do with that what you will. I do think that um, it's probably, uh, I think the, the, well, I can, I can only tell you what I am going, what my, our decision making process as parents is. Um, I will not permit my uh, daughter uh, until she can make decisions on, on her own behalf to do any kind of martial, like, like any kind of striking martial arts, maybe Jiu Jitsu, uh, 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 Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or something like that. Um, but not, you know, no kind of like uh, Muay Thai or you know, something like that. Um, just because, well, first of all, she doesn't have, she's, take it from me, she doesn't have the genetics of a, of a world-class fighter, <laughs> right? Uh, and same goes with, you know, other just like high contact sports. And so her, the future, of her well-being is going to be almost entirely based on the structural integrity of her brain. <laughs> uh, and so protecting her brain is the top priority for us. Um, but, you know, not everybody is in as uh, privileged a position as we are in. Um, and, you know, sometimes these sports are tickets to, you know, uh, much better conditions for that person and for their family. So, um, but I do think that like the ethical decision as to whether or not a, a child, a developing brain should be put in the context where they're gonna be smashed in the head. I think that, that that's iffy. An adult making that decision, totally different. Um, so, uh, How big is Trump's brain? It's probably about the same size as everybody else. Um, okay. People have killed themselves over tinnitus. Terrible affliction. Yeah, I mean, and there's also this, this wide spectrum of severity, too. Um, and there's, you know, so many different things that can cause tinnitus. Like, it can arise, again, for anybody that just came in, tinnitus is that persistent ringing or hissing in, in the ear that some people experience, a lot of people experience. You probably, almost everybody in here has probably experienced If you've ever been to a, a Metallica concert or, you know, an Audio Slave concert like I went to, um, when you're in the car walking home afterwards, you are experiencing acute tinnitus, that like ringing in the ear, like, where is that coming from? That's tinnitus. But that's like a very specific form of it. It's acute and it almost always goes away. Tinnitus can um, arise from some disruption of activity anywhere along the auditory pathway. Um, okay, is there a, a correlation between saliva and stress? 
interesting, saliva and stress. Well, yes, I mean, for somebody who is in experiencing like a noradrenergic dump, right, a fight or flight uh, 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 experience, um, there, there can be like a cholinergic mechanism that prevents salivation, I believe. And so you can develop cotton mouth. That's why like if you've ever had to give a talk in front of a big group of people or whatever, you sometimes can develop cotton mouth. That's, that's what that is. Um, but I, I'm not quite sure what other type of connection you might be uh, suggesting. Um, all right. Yeah, right. Loud ringing in the ears for 24 hours a day. Jeez. Um, what's happening in the brain when people fall in love with somebody? That's a great, great topic, little Lola. Love it. Um, actually, I did a podcast episode on love. And um, so the short story is it's a whole cascade of neurochemistry and neuronal activity that basically motivates humans to engage in what are like objectively irrational behaviors. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, you know, things like, you know, the, the fact that I would die to protect my daughter, who's quite a bit younger than me, like from a purely objective, like if you're just like Spock evaluating human behavior, that's irrational, right? Theoretically, people should prioritize their own well-being above all else and then the people they love uh, after that. But that's just not that, you know, and that's obviously a specific kind of love, right? Um, the love of family, right? Uh, not like affectionate love. Uh, and so, hey, Haley. <laughs> um, so it, that is an irrational pattern of activity. I mean, evolutionarily, you can make a very strong argument that it's actually not irrational. But, you know, just like in terms of proximal um, decision making, it is. Um, but then romantic love definitely, uh, 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 you know, engenders a whole slew of irrational behavior and rumination and, you know, perseverative behaviors. Um, OK, so so, you know, let's just go through the big bullet points. The first probably most well-established um, uh, neurochemical involved in any kind of it, like in love, but not just love is oxytocin. Oxytocin has been called the love hormone, uh, even though it's not that simple. It's involved in things beyond just oxytocin or in things beyond just love. Uh, it's involved in like social trust and stuff like that. Um, and so uh, generally speaking, when you are around somebody whom you love, whether it's a romantic love, but also around a family member that you love, um, there is this increase in oxytocin. Oxytocin is also very, very critical for the bond that a mother has with her with her children, uh, which is a very unique, you know, kind of bond, um, particularly early on. Uh, so there's that. There's also there, there's a fun study that basically got together a whole a whole big group of couples or people who had just broken up um, from relationships that they, you know, say that they were in love. Um, and they evaluated any kind of differences in patterns of brain activity between people who have, you know, stayed together for years and years and they're still in love versus people who, you know, were in love, but then they broke up. And there was this, um, you know, any of my fellow, you know, addiction slash, you know, uh, neuropharmacology friends would be unsurprised, but there was this um, elevated signal in a part of the brain called the ventral tegmental area, which is a part of the, it's like almost kind of right where the brain stem kind of plugs into <laughs> the, the, uh, the cerebrum, I guess, or the, the bigger part of the brain. Um, and uh, it produces a, a huge, like maybe the majority of dopamine in the brain, certainly the majority of dopamine that's associated with like uh, um, motivated behavior, mood, reward, uh, really expectation of reward, but reward shorthand. Um, the, the, these couples that have stayed in love and stayed together for a very long time had elevated um, ventral tegmental area activity, uh, which would correspond almost certainly to elevated dopaminergic activity. And so it might be the case that that's at least part of what distinguishes, you know, when somebody, oh, I'm sorry, and another part of the study, kind of important part of the study. So they would show pictures of, you know, somebody's partner and then they'd also show pictures of, you know, objectively, like, very attractive people, right? Um, and so the idea is, like, you know, there's attraction, and then there's love and attraction, right? And so what can distinguish, you know, the response of somebody who's in love, been in love, still together, with somebody for years when they see their picture versus when they see somebody that they find attractive? Um, and it was that ventral tegmental uh, uh, signal. At least that was part of it. Uh, you can check it out. Podcast called Wired to Be Weird on iTunes and Stitcher. Scientist of Wish. 
I don't think I'm a scientist of wish. Uh, chocolate, chocolate's great. Uh, I'm a fan. Thank you for sharing. It was so painful and so frequent. I was just wondering, geez. Um, okay, so what happens when you die? Does your brain stop working? Yeah, yep, <laughs> uh, pretty much. Uh, you know, there are like different sort of technical definitions of what qualifies as death technically, you know? Um, but to a neuroscientist, uh, there, all of the interesting things about being alive um, cease to occur when electrochemical activity in the brain ceases to, to occur. Um, you can technically keep so somebody animated, right? Or like you can, you know, keep their tissues from deteriorating by keeping their heart beating, you know, keeping their, their lungs um, respiring. But, uh, but for me, you know, that, that's almost a semantic definition, you know? Um, and uh, so, so yeah. Uh, when will you be installing Neuralink into the general public? I have cash in hand. <laughs> Uh, it's probably going to be very expensive. Um, and actually, early on, so Neuralink, for anybody that's not familiar, that's a, a, one of Elon Musk's companies, the goal of which is to develop a whole brain computer interface to enable the human brain, human mind, to interface very smoothly and efficiently with computers um, and with each other, right? So right now, our, our ability to communicate is pretty limited. It's pretty remarkable relative to other animals, of course, but it's pretty limited to the use of words, right? And so um, different languages have slightly different words and therefore different capabilities of com you know, communicating ideas. Um, and uh, so um, with something like Neuralink, we would, instead of having to say all these sentences, I could just like, convey to you a thought, a series of images, you know, uh, emotions, things like that. And I could just like, you know, if you gave me permission, selectively activate those, those neurons. Um, and so, it, you know, communication on a, you know, uh, millisecond time scale rather than a you know, several minute long time scale. Um, but probably the first implants or almost certainly the first implants are going to be in people who are suffering from some kind of malady, maybe a form of paralysis or something like that, some motor neuron disease where, um, you know, neurons that are associated with movement just are misbehaving. And um, if only you could just control their activity in a very selective way, you would essentially be cured of that condition, at least for a period of time. Uh, and so if you don't have any of those conditions, then you're probably not going to be a, a candidate early on. Um, but, you know, if the question is, would I ever implant something like a Neuralink? Yeah, I totally would. I wouldn't be first in line. That's for very sure. I wouldn't be first in line. Um, but, you know, once it, once it was like well established, um, uh, then yeah, I, I would check it out. Um, all right, how things? It's by suffering from dementia. Uh, all right, people have killed right. All right, well, um, maybe I should just call it a day. I hope uh, for anybody that has that's had their a day off. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a podcast called Why It To Be Weird. I have a YouTube channel. Oh, why I do it? YouTube channel, youtube.com slash anthropoid, where I talk about specific topics sort of in depth before um, starting any kind of live conversation. Uh, so youtube.com slash anthropoid. You can go, um, you know, prod the subscribe button if you're interested in doing that. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave you with that. Uh, have a great rest of your week. Thanks for joining. All right. So this is the awkward part where YouTube is still going. So uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, let me know what you think. Uh, and um, you know, if you're not subscribed, maybe you consider if you enjoy these topics. Otherwise, no worries. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching.